Assalamu alaikum everyone. Welcome back to the fourth class of um of the Johara Tawheed. This is going through Ash'ari Aqidah. We've been going through it for a few weeks so far, and obviously it's not strictly related to the Maliki Madhab, but um encompasses all of the Madahib, but we're doing it in the Maliki section of this because the scholar himself, Ibrahim al-Laqani, was from the Malikiya. And in fact, pretty much all of the Malikis follow the Ash'ari Aqidah, the vast majority of them. So we've uh, gone through about 30 lines. We've reached line 30 for those who have the books of the Jawhara Tawheed. Um, and that's the line, فَهَلَّهُ إِذْرَاقِ So, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ شَيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ وَصَلَّاةُ وَسَلَّامُ عَلَى خَيْرِ الْمُرْسَلِينَ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَأَصْحَابِهِ أَجْمَعِينَ وَلَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ الْعَلِيِّ الْعَظِيمِ سبحانك اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم so we've been going through the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We've been going through the section known as the ilahiyat, the things relating to what we have to believe with respect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We've gone through the attributes of salbiya and the attributes of what's called ma'ani, of meanings, of concepts. Um, and now we've come on to something which is a disagreement amongst the people of this science, whether this is actually an attribute or not. Because if you remember last week, we talked about some and basar and kalam, hearing, sight, and speech. Well, hearing and sight and speech relate to the senses. And um, there are other senses that we have. We have the sense of touch, which the Arabs call lumps, where you can tell whether something is smooth or when something is rough how could you tell whether something is smooth or rough without touching it looking at it won't be able to tell you how it feels even somebody describing to you or knowing how it is is not the same as actually the act of feeling it um and then you have smell um how you you, you can sense something through your smelling of that thing and so on and so forth so these are other attributes that give you knowledge of aspects of things that you don't get purely through knowledge or pu purely through seeing or purely through hearing. So they describe these aspects that are not described in the Quran, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is called the semi basir, but there's no, he's never called the, the one who smells or the one who touches in that same way. They describe these attributes as idraq, perception, or the being able to perceive things or understand things through these other senses. Um, and there's a difference of opinion about whether idraq is an attribute that we have to associate or attribute to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not. Um, when you do it, when you do attribute it, obviously there's another one as well, which is taste, another way of understanding things. So they say, well, do we have to attribute these three senses also to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because if we have them, and uh, um, you know, and they are considered amongst us attributes of perfection. In other words, if somebody comes, he's deficient, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is above having any deficiency, then surely they should be attributed to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala as well, because Allah uh, cannot be described by any imperfection. But it does not necessarily follow that because something is an imperfection for us or a perfection for us, it, it's a perfection for the Creator. For example, somebody who is unmarried is considered often in the, amongst Arab circles anyway to be lesser than somebody who has taken that step who's who's per perfected himself by reaching the next level somebody who doesn't have children is considered to be something so obviously this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be described with having children or um being married and having partners so the fact that they're Signs of perfection amongst us does not make them necessarily signs of perfection for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it doesn't necessarily follow um, that it, Allah has to be described by their, by their opposites if he's not described by them in, this, in these particular things, because you can say that they fall under the umbrella of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge. So there's a difference of opinion about Ithraq. The fact that we have some and basar, means that some people say, well, the fact that those ones are included means these other ones should be as well. 
and they base that on the fact that they think that some basar are part of Allah's attributes because they are intellectually part of his attributes. We have to rationally accept them to be his attributes because of the fact that they cast aside imperfection. But the, but the others say, no, Allah's, we, the only reason we ascribe hearing and sight to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and speaking is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes himself with those particular attributes in his book and what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said about what he brought. So we don't say that Allah is hearing because it's intellectually necessary for him to hear. We do it because Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala told us that he hears. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala didn't tell us that he has these other particular senses that we are describing here. So there's a difference of opinion. Some people say though you can't definitively say that it's not possible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have this attribute. We can't definitively say that it is one of his attributes. So they say, oh, we're not going to get involved in this discussion. And that's the safest <laughs> position to often take in these types of things. So this is his, his line here. He says, فَهَلَّهُ idrak." Does he have idrak? Which is, as I said, is perceiving or knowing something through means not just necessarily through the mind and knowledge, perceiving it. Um, awla or not khulfun in this matter there is khulf there is ikhtilaf there is a difference of opinion and amongst a group of people some of the people of this science sahafihi al waqfu they take the most correct approach to be waqf to be to leave it to stop without engaging in this particular debate of saying yes it is or no it isn't Ayyun alimun qadirun muridun sami' basirun ma yasha'u yuridu. So now we're going into the, the active participles of the attributes that we've talked about. So when you say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ha life, what is the consequence of having life? That you are living. So some people say that these things here are included as sifat ma'nawiyya. So the, sif the, the sifat al-ma'ani are the actual concepts or meanings themselves, like power, will, um, life, seeing, hearing. And these active participles they then describe as the hal, the, the, when, you, when you're engaging in that particular thing. So it's, a, it's, it's one of the aspects of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that because he has the attribute, his hal is one of being alive, of being living. This, these are the people who accept the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sifat ma'anawiyya, which is not all of the Ash'ariyya. The Ash'aris have a difference of opinion about this matter amongst themselves. Imam al-Sanusi, who was one of the great scholars of the Ash'ariyya, took the position that these are what's called ahwal, the sifat al ma'nawiyya, and linguistically, they break things down into different... Th every, everything can, is of one of four types. It's either mawjood, which means it's fully existent in a way that you can realize it and see it and perceive it, um, or it's ma'doom, it has no existence at all, or it's somewhere in between. It has some level of existence, but that existence is not enough that you can necessarily perceive it as a thing. And they call that a hal. So it has a level of existence, walking. Some, you know, for example, that's, a, that's, a, that's an act. Somebody going through a door, walking. What they're doing, going through that door is their hal, is their state. That thing that they're doing has some level of existence to it. But it's not a thing in itself, but it has a level of existence that you can perceive it in some way, and not just in your mind. So those are three things. And then there's another thing which is called i'tirad, uh, not i'tirad, i'tibar, sorry, i'tibar, um, which is of two types. I'tibar, where it, uh, you, you see something, but then you attribute something to it in your mind alone. So example, somebody moves, and then you describe that movement as walking. That thing of working out a concept of walking in your mind and then ascribing it to something which is simply a, a motion, 
it doesn't have any reality to it. The thing that has the level of reality to it is the moving. But you're describing it with the process of walking is something that that you have intellectualized in in your mind, in a sense, to to give meaning to that thing within your mind, the particular way that that person is moving. So that wouldn't be that walking itself in that particular instant has any reality to it. It simply has a reality in your mind, and the thing that has a reality is the movement. And then there's the other type of i'tibar, which is something that has no reality whatsoever. It's not connected to anything that you perceive. For example, imagination or thinking, you know, thinking of the possibility of there being a river or, or a sea full of oil. You know, uh, it's a possibility that you could have something the size of the Atlantic Ocean and all of it oil. But it's not something that's ever perceived as a reality. So it's something you can simply construct it in your mind. This is called etibar, but they don't have any reality outside of the mind. Sometimes they have no level of reality at all. So those who say there is no sifa ma'nawiya say that when we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is hay, it's simply in etibar, how we're, dis- we're, we're describing what hayat is. It's not a hal, it's not something separate from hayat. Because as we said, hal, or this thing that we call a hal has its own reality, which is somewhere between between being fully existent and non-existent. So it has a level of existence in itself, in which case then you have to say it's a separate attribute. <laughs> Allah being hay is separate because it's got its own level of reality to him having haya in that sense. So that's the way they, they talk about the sifa ma'nawi. But in a sense, it's the same thing. Allah, the thing we, we have to believe is that Allah's is alive. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has power. But that's 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 what we had to have to believe. Whether it's something that's separate in its own right from him having power, him being powerful, is is a separate matter. But the majority of the scholars of the Ashariya say no, it's not separate. And simply it's the description of the attribute. It's a consequence of the attribute. It's what the attribute means. So he has hay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is living and his life is intrinsic to him. It's part of his that. It's not like us, who a life is external to us, as you can see by a dead body. It's the same, same person. They die. There's no life in it anymore. So the life is something which is external to us in a sense. It's, brought, it's given to us and then taken out again. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his life is fully intrinsic. Um, Alim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is knowing um, intrinsically again it's not something that's learnt he simply has knowledge of everything <laughs> it's there it's within himself the knowledge of I'm, I'm, we're going to come to these what's called muta'alliqat in a minute when we say he's knowledge, he has knowledge what does he have knowledge of and so on that's what we're going to come to in a minute Qadir again we talked about Qudra Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has, has power to do anything that is possible for him to do and murid, he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has will, he is willing. Samir, he is, see, he is hearing. Basir, he is hearing. And ma um, yasha'u yuridu here is simply meaning that there's no difference between mashia, when we say masha'Allah, what Allah wills, insha'Allah, if Allah wills. That word sha'a, there's no difference in meaning between that word and the word arada. When we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has irada, has will, that's the same as he have, him having mashi'ah. They mean, they, mean the, they mean the same thing. They are, there are some people who claim that there's a difference between them in that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will in the sense of his mashi'ah, when we say masha'Allah or insha'Allah, was, was some, was, is his eternal attribute. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's irada is only when there are things that he wills come to, comes to pass. The, the muradat, whatever it's willed. So there's some people who separated them, called the karamiya, and, uh, but the, the position that we all have is that they mean the same thing. Mashia, inshallah, and harada, same thing. The people, some of the people who said they were separate things, there's a story that they're told of Imam Shajari, one of the scholars of the past. He used to always mention in his classes 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's words, Kullu yawmin huwa fi sha'n. This is from the um, Sharh of Al Bayjuri. Every day, Allah, this is in Surah Rahman, every day Allah is upon an affair, a sha'n, a matter, a doing. And um, one of the, one of the stu a student came up to him after one of his classes and said, Okay, if kullu yawmin fi sha'n, then what is Allah's sha'n today? If every day Allah is on a sha'n, is on a, whatever this word is, a matter, then what is the sha'n of Allah today? And he didn't have an answer. He had uh, no idea how to, how to answer this thing, because it's basically almost the implication that there's something new being created in, in, every, in every moment, is the implication of this. And so he was saying, well, if he was saying that, then what is the particular thing that Allah is doing today? What is he doing in this very second? And um, so he went home, didn't know how to quite to answer this question. He went to sleep and the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi came to him in his sleep and said, the person who asked you this was Al-Khidr. I don't know if you've heard of Al-Khidr, but he's one of the prophets of the past who Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala gave extreme long years to. So he's still still alive today. He's in the story of Musa Alayhi Salaam in the Quran, where he's, where, where he, you know, punctured the uh, the ship and, um, you know, built the wall and so on and so forth. That's that's Al Khidr. Anyway, he, so he's he's still around today. He's one of the the, the few people who Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala gave extreme longevity to. Um, and so uh, he's he said, this man who asked you this is is Al Khidr. And he said you should tell him when he comes again tomorrow that Shu'unun uh, Yubdiha um that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's shu'un are things that he makes manifest, that he reveals to people, yubdiha, that he makes abda, and not things that he starts anew, that he creates anew, the things that he didn't know about before and then he knows about in each moment. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being in shatan every every moment is not that he is creating something or something is new is coming into his knowledge in each moment, but that he is unveiling those things for the creation in each moment. That's what it means by that. So he so he went and he went back and um, told the student this the next day, and he, the student said to him, "Salla ala man allamaka hada." May Allah subhanahu wa taala give his salawat, his his prayers on the one who taught you this. And then he went away. <laughs> Mutakallimun. So the last of these descriptors of the attributes and how and and, and, and what they mean with regard to us, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala usually refers to himself by his names, which are descriptors of these particular attributes. He would normally say, Allah uh, for in qadir, Allah is powerful over all things, or Allah is Sami'un Basir. So when we see in the Quran, we usually see the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that describe these attributes rather than the attributes themselves. So Allah is mutakallim, means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always speaking. Speaking, by the way, is different to knowing. In the, in, even with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in that knowing is un, uh, uncovering and being able to get to, to the, the, whatever it seems to be hidden in anything. You know everything about something, that means you can uncover every hidden aspect of it. Nothing is hidden from you. Whereas speaking is communicating or indicating things, something. Dalala, giving a name to something. He taught Adam all of the names. So, uh, you know, kalam is indicating something, whereas knowledge is knowing the, uh, the hidden aspects of something that's not, that's not necessarily shown to you. So he says here, Mutakallim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also Mutakallim. Thumma, when, when you see the word, uh, now when you, if you study Arabic, the word Thumma is usually translated as then. Thumma. But Thumma is often simply used, in, in English we have paragraphs. If you want to start to talk about something which is slightly disconnected from what you are talking about before, sometimes you have a sentence, sometimes you have a paragraph when it's completely disconnected. In Arabic, you often, if you want to talk about something that's new, istinaf, you would use the word thumma then. So it's just talking about something slightly different to what he was talking about before. 
He says, Thumma, sifatu that, laysa bi ghayrin, laysa bi ghayri, aw bi ayni that. Then, the sifat of the that, the attributes of the that, the that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's, for want of a better word, essence. Because you can't use the word body, you can't use necessarily the word entity, whatever it is. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in a sense. The sifat of the that, the attributes of, of the essence are the ones we've just been talking about. The sifat al ma'ani. These particular seven attributes of, of, of power, knowledge, will, life, hearing, seeing, speaking. Those particular attributes. This is the sifat of that. He said, the laysat bi ghayri aw bi ayni that. They're not wholly separate from the that. They're not their own thing. They, we don't make the mistake of the, the Greeks and the Romans and other people who started to separate the attributes and then worship power alone and then give power a face and uh, make it a god or worship knowledge alone, Athena, whatever it is, make, and give knowledge of a particular aspect and separate them completely, as if they are se somehow separate from God, the godhood. You have each one being a thing in its own right. Because if you do that, it's almost the same as the, as the Christians, in a sense. You're having, you're having three. The, you know, they, have, they have the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit, like three separate things that are, that are eternal. If we're saying all of these are from the Azal, from before time, and you've separated them all, then in a sense, almost you're having like eight gods if they're fully separate from each other. <laughs> so obviously that's not the case. The last part of is one. We've already de determined that. So they're not fully separate, but they're not behind that. They don't refer to the essence. They're not the same thing. They, if when you talk about Allah's Taala's power, it doesn't mean you're talking about his godhood in a sense, or Allah's Taala's essence. When you talk about his knowledge, they're talking about a meaning above, over and above the that, but not the that itself. Is that understood? They, they're, they're not wholly different, and they're not, whole, they're not the same thing. They're, you know, they're not completely separate, and they're not at the same time completely the same either. Because the meaning of a, the word sifa, is an attribute, is something that is not the essence, but something that's over and above the essence that you can describe that thing by. Linguistically. فَقُدْرَةٌ بِمُمْكِنٍ تَعَلَّقَتْ بِلَا تَنَاهِي مَا بِهِ تَعَلَّقَتْ so now we talk about what's called the ta'allukat, the things to which the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relate to, connect to, deal with. When you talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power, what does that connect to? What does Allah have power over? Does Allah have power over what is necessary? Can he create a being like himself? of this, a, a second god? Or can he have a child? It's the impossible. Does Allah have power to do those things? So no. Power relates to one of the three categories that we've been talking about. We talked about wajibat, the things that are necessary. Allah's power to Allah's qudra has no impact to the things that are necessary. He can't change them. They're necessary. They have to be that way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qudra has no impact to the things that are impossible. If something is impossible, it means it can't happen. Allah, even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot make it happen. Allah cannot make it that he has a son. Or a wife. Or a, a, a god of the same level as himself, that he, a partner that he creates. It's impossible because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qudra does not impact those things. When we talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qudra, it only impacts what is mumkin, what is possible, the category of possible things. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qudra relates to all possibilities, whether they have been realized or have not been realized. Whether the possibility of me, for example, sitting here in this room giving this lesson, or the possibility that 
I am elsewhere doing something else or the possibility that I wasn't born or any of these things. All of these are all possible facilities and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qudra relates to all of them. It's only, by the way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qudra when it connects with his irada, the, because irada is called the takhsis, particularization, specifying out of all of the infinite possibilities of the universe of things that could happen, his will is what makes one particular thing happen. That's the taxis. So he says here, bila tanahi, the possibilities are without limit. There is no limit to these possibilities. It's completely infinite. Because part of that, for example, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that we will be existent from this time until inf infinity, because heaven and hell don't have an end point. The next world doesn't have an end point. So they are infinite. That doesn't mean that the number of things in the universe is infinite. It is finite. The number of realized possibilities at this moment is finite. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qudra is infinite in terms of all of the things that it, that it can realize. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qudra, what he can do, his power. Allah has power to do all things. Allah has power over all things. So he says here, bimumkin in ta'allaqat, just something linguistically. When you include the object before the verb in Arabic, it has the, the ability of making it mean only that object and nothing else. Iyaka na'budu. You alone, iyaka, you, literally, you, iyaka, na'budu, we worship. The fact that it's before the verb means you alone, iyaka. You alone we worship. We don't worship anyone beside you. And the same here. It is connected only with what is mumkin, with what is possible. Without any ending, infinitely. Without any ending of the things with which it is connected to Allah. That's what that means then. وَوَحْدَ تَنْ أَوْجِبْ لَهَا And affirm, make it necessary, consider it necessary that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His qudra is only one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have multiple powers. You know, like in the sense of, you know, the superhero comics and all those sort of things, you know, they have their abilities and their powers, and this one has that one, and this one has that one. It's not that way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala simply has power. It's power over all things. But you can't separate his power into individual aspects to it or individual powers. There can't be more than one power. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this power for these things and that power for those things. He's only one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his power is not indivisible. It's simply one. He has power. It's part of who he is. Oh, wa and in the same way as this, as as qudra, like this qudra, irada, wal ilm. So first, the irada. Irada meaning will. The same thing applies to irada. Allah subhanahu wa taala's irada only impacts what is possible. Allah cannot, subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot will himself out of existence, for example. He cannot will himself to have a child, for example. His will only impacts what is possible, the realm of the possible, not the realm of the impossible or the necessary. And also in the same way, it is only one. There's only one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has will. It's not that he has this will and that will and that desire and that desire, no. The same applies to knowledge as to, as to the first two we talked about, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power and his will. And he says the same applies to knowledge, but it not only ammadi, it not only encompasses this thing we've been talking about, the mumkinat, the possibilities, doesn't only encompass that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge. 
It is not it doesn't only know all of the things that are possible, everything. The cliche in Alim, there's nothing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't know about. Um but he also knows what is wajib, what is what is necessary, and what is mumtani. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's impossible. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is necessary for him, that there is no God but him. And he indeed tells us about this in, in his book regularly. He knows that it is impossible for himself to have a son, and he knows what it would lead to had did that happen the chaos and the fitna and he describes that to us in in his book and through his messenger all of those things the things that can be and cannot be he knows them all. the things that might be and that are he knows it all allah's Allah's knowledge stretches to everything it's wider than his power and his irada and then um, i suppose when you come to the level of existent things there is, although you can't ascribe time elements to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is sort of Allah's knowledge, followed by his will, followed by his power, bringing something about. Although you can't really say followed by in time, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala simply says, kun fayakun, be and it is. There's no time. <laughs> it doesn't take time. It's not done in stages. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qudra does not require that it has to be done this step first and that step, the way we do things. I mean, even though the things about this, the, the, the heavens being created in a certain number of days and stuff, that's simply the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to be done rather than it required taking time or effort for any of this to be done. Allah's power is simply saying to something be, and the, there's no time passing here. The moment that his will attaches to it, it is. And the same here applies to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's kalam, his speech. We're going to go into kalam with respect to the Quran next lesson, inshallah. But here we're simply talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's intrinsic attribute of speech, of his speech connecting to everything. Everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, he also has words for that everything and everything that is necessary and uh, everything that is impossible allah has words for it these words being used to describe it in his book about uh, certain things and then there is the, the commands and the prohibitions and everything but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's words connect to everything that he knows about and the way that he his his words connect as i said is different from the way that he knows these things but there's nothing that is not a recipient as i knew this is described the, the way things come into being is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying to them, kun, saying be. Um, and then you have the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, well, we're going to come to things like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and other and the names of things and how those things are sometimes before before creation and taught to creation a little bit later. So he says here, so let us follow. In other words, these things that I've been talking about here, these aspects of how, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qudra and his irada connect to, they're not actually things that you have to, you, you have to use your aql and understand fully. He's going through them in order for completion. But he says here, these things, it's perfectly fine for you to leave it to people who dedicate themselves and devote themselves to studying these subjects and then follow them. We can follow them. We don't need to go into necessarily this depth, but it can be helpful. To understand how these things work but it's not a necessary thing for every single person what you have to do simply is to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has these attributes to subdivide what they connect to is not something that is necessary or to go even further and talk about tanjis and saluhi and all of these types of things where where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attributes are before existence comes into being and how it connects to existence then appearing and how it impacts when existence is by existence i mean our existence Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who has true existence but when it impacts these things how how they connect all of these things are, are beyond the scope of most people to need to go into وَكُلُّ مَوْجُودٍ 
anid lisam'i bihi every mawjud so we, we've talked about here so far um four of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attributes of the ma'ani attributes there's still three le three left so the first two he says sama which is hearing and basar which is seeing and you can add to that he uh, he says here in Iraq. So, Kullu Mawjood, everything that is existent, bihi. He, so this is, this is an instruction to us, um, which is connected to, related to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's stamma. Relate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hearing and seeing and idraq for those who think that idraq is one of his attributes. And do you remember what idraq was? The other senses, yeah. So those who say that there is an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what do these things impact? And he says here, they only impact what is mawjood, not what is ma'loom. So in the sea of potential things, for example, me being here or me possibly being somewhere else, these attributes, some ambassador, relate to the potential of me actually being here, I'm existent. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hearing and his seeing impacts everything that is actually here in the existence of the created world and also what is existent for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the mawjood of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but not what is not what is forbidden for example or, or impossible for him so what exactly is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sum and his basar and well the first thing you have to realize is that it's not the same as ours when we say uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Laysa kamithli hi shay wa huwa sami al wasir. There is nothing like him at any level. He is the hearing, the seeing. So immediately after said there is nothing like him, he says he is the hearing and the seeing. And indeed, in one of the um of the uh, hadith of the Messenger of Allah when he, when when it's mentioned, and this is also, I think, uh, what well, amongst the Christians known that um Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam on his surah, on his whatever this word means. Some people, you know, think that it means in the same in the in the same as himself, on the, the same the same shape as himself, whatever. But they but the majority of people they interpret that to mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam with these types of attributes that we know about, some and basar. But that still doesn't mean that when we hear. We hear sounds. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala necessarily only hears sounds. Or when we see, we see particles and waves or whatever else we see, light and things like that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's seeing only relates to the thing, the types of things that we see. It's not limited, it's not like us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sight extends to things that we wouldn't even think are seeable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hearing extends to things that we wouldn't even think are hearable. So that's the important thing to realize. But it doesn't mean that um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hearing and his sight are the same as his knowledge, simply by the fact that they connect to all existing things. It doesn't mean that the way that they connect to them is the same, it's the same as the way that his knowledge connects to them. There's a difference, as he mentions in a moment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's seeing of something it's not the same as his knowing of it. And how do we know that? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us words and languages. And through, the, through his books and his messages. And basically, we are taught to take words at their meaning, unless there is something to indicate that that meaning is not what is meant in a particular place. Yeah? So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that he is sami'um alim, he is hearing and knowing. They're two distinct things. Obviously, with sama, we associate it with the ear and hearing. So it's a particular process that is meant by the by sama. Or speaking, we associate with our tongue and what comes out of our mouths. Or sight with our eyes. Whereas knowing, we associate with what is within our heart or within our within our mind. So this is linguistically. And the basic ruling is if something has a linguistic meaning, unless there's proof that it doesn't have that, that's the meaning you have to associate, you, you have to ascribe to it legally. And so simply by linguistic things, we know that these attributes are not the same. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and also by the fact that he uses them together. And he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not waste words in that sense in his book. So sami'un alim, sami'un basir. Hearing is not the same as seeing. Speaking is not the same as hearing. Knowing is not the same as hearing, and so on and so forth. They're all different, but exactly how they impact things is not the same as the way that we ourselves would associate those particular attributes without, from ourselves. So he says here, All of these things are different to ilm, are separate from knowledge. I'll just, just go through the previous line fully before I do that. In every existent thing, al-nilp, connect, lissam'i, to hearing this thing. Kada, similarly, al-basar, seeing, idraquhu, and his idraq, his perception, in qilabihi, if you, if the position is taken that it is an attribute. وَغَيْرُ عِلْمٍ هَذِهِ And all of these things, هَذِهِ, are separate from knowledge, are not the same thing as knowledge. كَمَا ثَبَتْ As has been proven, as had by language and by the by their usage in the Quran. ثُمَّ الْحَيَاتُ Then the final attribute, hayat, life. مَا بِشَيْءٍ تَعَلَّقًا Doesn't connect to anything. Like the, pur the purpose of making a hayat an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is it's a precursor to other attributes. Other attributes could not exist without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being alive. Again, ling linguistically, from where we understand things, that if you want to have will, you have to be living. If you want to have power, you have to be living. Sight and hearing and speech are all also similar things. A dead body no longer has will or power, whereas one that has the semblance of life in has these things. So life is, is a necessary precursor and is not connected to anything apart from the fact that it makes other attributes impossible. وَعِنْدَنَا Amongst us وَعِنْدَنَا By us, he means the people of the Ash'ariyah, or go to beyond that, the people on the Haqq, the people who are following the true understanding of how things are. وَعِنْدَنَا أَسْمَاءُهُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's asma al azima His elevated, exalted, blessed, um, beyond which anybody else could, be, could, be, could, could possibly have. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names are ones that nobody else really sh can be described by. His, his exalted names um, are Qadima. Are not Haditha. We haven't, we're not the ones who coined these names. We didn't come up with these names. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had these names even before existence came about. By the names, we're not talking about necessarily the words we're using, but those things that the names talk about. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're not talking about an Arabic name or an English name, but rather the quality that is described by that name. These particular names have belonged to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught them to us in the Azal, in the time before time. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala named himself. We didn't name him. So when we talk about Allah, it's not a name that human beings have come up with as a way of describing something indescribable to themselves. This name was one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had before creation came, in, came into being. And these particular names were then taught to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Sayyidina Adam alayhi sallam, وَعَلَّمَ Adam الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا And he taught Adam the names, all of them. These things were there before existence. Allah subhanahu wa also in terms of the qualities that these names described, always had those qualities. You call him al-khaliq, that particular quality of being able to create is something Allah subhanahu wa has always had. Kada sifatu 
Similarly, and we've already mentioned this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sifat al-ma'ani, qudra, irada, haya. These are all things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has had before existence came into being. We, they, they do not require created world for the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be described by these things. He, can be, he was described by them even before the created world existed. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names are Alvima means that they are all majestic. They all have a quality, uh, uh, an exalted nature to them. But it doesn't necessitate, although some people say that it does. But the strongest is it doesn't necessitate that all these names are equal. There are words, there are names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are more majestic than others. Hence, what we have, for example, Al Ismul Adam the greatest or the most exalted name, which is one of the ways that the name Allah is described, the Ismail Jalala. And um, that's mentioned in the Quran, wa kalimatullahi hil ulya. The kalima, the, the word of Allah, the word Allah, is the ulya, the most high. And also, wa la dhikrullahi akbar. And the mentioning of Allah is greater. So there are, there are levels to these names, but they're all, they're, every single name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is majestic and exalted. Um, and Qadim, some being greater than others. وَاخْتِيرَ أَنَّ أَسْمَاءَهُ وَأَسْمَاهُ تَوْقِيفِيَ There is a difference of opinion, but he's saying the chosen position of the people of this science is that the names, the asma of Allah, are tawqifiya. They have been reasoning or by anything else, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us them through his summer. So how do we know the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? From the kitab and the sunnah. From the Quran and what the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to us, because he was the Qur'an walking, and his, his, his words, um, He doesn't speak from whim. It is nothing but wahi, revelation, that has been revealed to him. So the words of the Messenger of Allah, so even the hadith, are, you know, divinely inspired. So everything that he said is considered to be a mas, a divine text, in like the, the way that the Qur'an is. So when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa described the names of Allah, that is tawqif. That is something that we, we can accept as Allah being described. What this means is we can't just make up names to describe Allah. We can't say, oh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has this particular attribute. So this now is a name that I'm going to give to him. Because, you know, this attribute is similar to that one. So if, that's, if, it's, if they're similar, then I can use that. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names are limited to what he has allowed. It doesn't mean that his names are limited. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names are not limited, but the ones that we can use to describe him are. Is that clear? Similarly, his attributes. Allah, we can't describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with an attribute except those described this, that he had, with which he has described himself or with which the Messenger of وسلم, described him. You can't simply sort of start using other words to describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he's beyond our capacity to describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, although there is a difference of opinion about this. Some people like Imam al-Ghazali said in terms of description, if, if a word means the same thing as another word, then it's fine to describe him, but you can't go and make, give, uh, ascribe a name to him other than the names he had. And people have taken different positions with regard to these things. But he's saying, Wahtira, the one that is chosen by the majority, the Jumhur, the majority of the people of the Muslims of this science, is that only describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the attributes he has described himself and only call him by the names that he has called himself. So he says here, in It is chosen that his names are tawqifi, are ones that have been settled for us and, and that we, we, we take from the divine text. Similarly, 
الصفات his attributes فاحفظ السمعية so if you want to know these names and you want to uh, have as many of them to hand as you can memorize the Sam'iyyah memorize the Quran and the Hadith get them from those sources and then you have it. then you have them that's where you that's where you'll get them وكل نص اوهم التشبيه اوله او فوض والرم تنزيها so he's now talking about another issue which is when you read the quran you come across certain descriptions of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are difficult because We've already stated that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unlike anything in creation. But then you find a description of him um, that, you know, it becomes problematic, such as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having a hand, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being above the throne, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala coming down from the, the highest heaven to the lowest heaven, as in the, the hadith, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Ja'a, coming, and his angels coming with him. All of these things are problematic because they are ways that we describe existence, created world. For example, falqa implies something being underneath you, implies body. Ja'a implies leaving somewhere to come somewhere else, going from one place to another. Yad, Hand, for example, implies a body that has different parts to it. All of these things are problematic. Um, there's, a, there's a long series of ayahs of Quran where it says, As for those who have zayr, who have deviants, in their hearts, um, and they, 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 these people follow the eyes of the Quran that have tashabu, you know, uh, have similarities to created things that are, that, are, that, are, that are problematic somehow in understanding them, if you take them at their surface, surface meaning. Um, and they follow it seeking to create fitna and seeking to interpret them falsely. And um, then he says, And then no one knows their ta'wil, the true interpretation of these things, illallah. Now, here there is an ayat. Some people stop. Stop. So the salaf, and they were considered to be the people who lived in the first five centuries of the Muslims, um, up until about 500 years after the Hijra. They basically did not engage in these mutashabihad. Um, they didn't talk about them. They didn't like any sort of conversation around these things, and they, they, they didn't delve into what they might mean. That's what he calls here, forward. They handed the affair over to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, literally. Um, that's the salaf. So they said, we don't know what that means, basically. We, I mean, basically on the understanding that they knew it didn't mean, for example, with Jah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left a place and came to another place, but we don't, we don't, know, we don't know what it means, is basically what they're saying. So they said, they're, they're, that's why their position is known as Aslam, is safer. Because they, they, weren't, they wouldn't falsely attribute a, a meaning to this. But um, also, they didn't bring any clarity to people who were being deceived by other people into thinking that it was literal. Which is why the Khalaf, the later generations, started to interpret. This is what he says, a will who. So he says, well, for example, when you say the yet, the, the yet of Allah, it means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power. For example, in certain in certain circumstances, or when you say uh, that Allah subhanahu wa taala istawa al arsh, that Allah subhanahu wa taala settled on the throne, which appears in the Quran a number of times, the salaf would say, okay, we well, we don't know what that means. 
But we, we, we Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said it, but we, we're not going to make any interpretation of it. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't sit down physically on a throne such that he has a throne underneath him and is going from a standing position to a sitting position. But we don't interpret it another other way. Whereas the Khalaf said, yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't do that. And then they went a step further and said, but that means by istawa al-arsh that he has mulk, that he has kingship, and that he has dominion, istila, over everything. So they gave, may gave some interpretation to avoid the people who were simply saying, yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a body. Mujassama and people like that. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a place and he's there and he's not there. <laughs> so basically, the problem that you might have with certain Christians who seem to have this idea of God having a big white beard sitting on a cloud or whatever it might be, simply being like us, <laughs> but more powerful. So that he says here, وَكُلُّ nasin, every attribute or every, te every text, by, by text here, sorry, he means either the Qur'an or the hadiths of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, divine texts. Ohama, that makes you start to think, tashbiha, or that, that creates in your mind's eye the idea of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being like something. In ex something that we know. Oh, will who? So the first one he starts basically because see, this was the Ash'ari doctrine. They came at a time when people were making false claims about what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala was and how and and were, were misleading people into understanding Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala had power over and didn't have power over and so on and so forth. So he came at that time. So he starts with the position of the Khalaf. Oh, will who? You know. Interpret it. Don't accept it as it is. Um, so that's the first position, the position of the Khalaf. Oh, for with, or hand your affair over to Allah. Warum tanziha, and aim for tanzih. Tanzih is the opposite of tashbih. Tanzih is saying that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is unlike anything, disconnected from everything, is over and above whatever the, whatever you come to. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is not like that. So he's saying here that even the people who did tafwil, who handed the affair over to Allah, they still did this first thing. They, 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 they still disassociated Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from being like that. For example, Kullu shayin halikun illa wajha. Kullu shayin halikun, this is an ayat of Quran, everything perishes except his face. Obviously, that can't mean what it means. Because then if you're if you saying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a face, are you then saying that he has hands and so on, that they perish, but the face doesn't? So obviously, uh, you, it, it needs to be interpreted at some level. But exactly what it means there by face, Allah knows best, according to the, the position of the Salaf. Whereas the, the Khalaf would then make some effort to say that that means the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing, you know, he's, he's that. And so they would interpret that based on the position, the, the linguistic position that a face, when you describe somebody's face, you're often describing the person. So it's a linguistic tool. So, I mean, the difference is the, the, the Salaf would say, okay, it doesn't mean a face in the sense that we know a face, but that's it, we'll leave it there. Whereas the Khalaf would say, okay, it doesn't mean a face, but what it does mean is this, in order to make it easier for people. Is that clear? So anyway, we'll leave it there, inshallah. We'll, um, we've done quite a lot today. If there are any questions about any of this, please ask anything. Any questions online? All clear or not clear? Okay, well, Bismillah, we'll finish there, inshallah. Bismillah ar barakatuh Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, maliki yawm id-din, iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in, ihdina sirat al-mustaqim, sirat al-ladhina namta alayhim, ghadil mutlubi alayhim, wa labbalin, ameen. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin abdika wa rasulika nabi ilmi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim taslima, subhanu rabbika rabbil azati ma'izifu muslamin al-muslimin, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaykum, see you next time, inshallah.